be on yet. Yes, we are. Good morning, Wallace. How is everybody this morning? It's good to see you. I think we need to send somebody out in the foyer and shoo them all in here. We, we've got uh, quite a few still out there, but it's good to have you this morning. Listen, I just want to give you a word of welcome, especially, not only, but especially if you're here, first time guest, second time guest and uh, you've come back to worship with us this morning, we would love for you to text the word welcome to the number that's on the screen for many reasons. We want to register your presence here, and we want to just send you a short uh, survey of what your experience was when you first got to Wallace and, and how we can do things differently, maybe to make the experience better. So please help us out and do that. You're, you're welcome to send that welcome every week if you want to, to let us know you're here but certainly if you're a first-time guest. We're glad you're here. You should be full of emotional energy. The Vols didn't lose yesterday. The Braves won last night. Sorry for those who DVR'd it or, or uh, uh, hadn't watched it yet. I may have spoiled that. But yes, they won last night. So you should have plenty of emotional energy to worship the Lord. In the Psalms, David said, I rejoice with them when they said, let's go into the house of the Lord. So we want to rejoice this morning. We want to pick up our emotional energy. We want to begin with an attitude of worship. Attitude's everything, right? That don't worship. This worships. So I just want you to put a smile on your face and know that you're in the house of the Lord. And we're about to lift him up in praise and worship and begin that with a time of prayer. Pray with me. God, we love you and thank you for the day you've given us. The brisk air this morning, Lord, just gives us life and wakes us up. And Lord, we want to bring our lives to you in worship this morning. We want to lift our hands. We want to lift our voices. We want to lift our hearts in praise. So God, let our attitudes be one of awe, submission, and worshiping a God who is truly worthy. Lord, for that we give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Please stand with us. In Psalm 46, we uh, learn that God is a mighty fortress. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our help in time of trouble. And we don't have to fear, right? Christ has won the victory. Christ has won the battle. He has overcome evil. And that's worth singing about. Let's sing this together.
Amen. Let's continue in worship as we think about our response to this God that is our fortress, this God that is our protector, this God who is our very salvation. He doesn't need anything from us. What can we offer to him? We can offer our complete submission. We can offer him our hearts. We can offer him our minds. We can offer him a life that is lived seeking after him, seeking after obedience to him. Let's sing this together.
is our hope in death. He is our joy. He is what sustains us. And for those that are in him, we will be with him forever in everlasting life, feasting with joy with him. Let's sing this together. Every day they devote themselves to and together Every day the Lord added those who were being saved. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. 
What happens if the extraordinary becomes ordinary? Ordinary becomes ordinary. That's the question that we've been working through, thinking through, marinating on as we've been walking through Acts chapter 2 and looking at the New Testament church. Today we're going to talk about what it would be if community impact were ordinary as we look at what was happening in this early church. There's a pastor named Steve Willis who was at First Baptist Church Canova in West Virginia. And the Lord had put on his heart a message that he wanted to share with his congregation. And so he knew that this would be a message that might be difficult to hear. And so he talked to some of his leaders in the church and was sharing with them what God was putting on his heart. And he told them that he felt like God was impressing upon him to share with his church a message about gluttony. Yeah. And so you can imagine kind of what his leader said, pastor, preach about anything, anything, but don't, don't do that one. Don't do that one. But over time, couple, about a couple weeks, maybe a month or so later, he just knew that this was a message that God was putting on his heart. And so it was, the, it was the Friday before Sunday that he was going to preach about gluttony to his church. And on that Friday, the Centers for Disease Control released a study declaring Huntington, West Virginia, which is where they live, to be the fattest city in America. It said that nearly half of the metro area residents were classified as obese. And so he he took this report. He shared it with the church in his sermon on that Sunday. He said, this is something that God has put on my heart for a long time. I just didn't know how to say it. So he says, here's hard and fast proof that we're the largest city in the largest region in the largest country on earth. And when I say the largest, he says, we're the most obese. And as a church, they began to develop education programs about nutrition and about healthier eating. They changed what they were eating on Wednesday nights. They began to have basically the biggest loser among their church and to see who could lose the most weight. They took all these various steps to try and help people to get this particular sin under control in their lives. And what they were doing was picked up upon by Jamie Oliver, who has a television show called Food Revolution. And so he goes to their town, he goes to their church, and he loves what they're doing. And, and it, it starts to take over the whole city. The, the, the city schools are changing what they're eating in the, in the cafeterias. I mean, all these things are happening all across the city. And when you hear this story, it was an extraordinary thing that happened. And what began in this church really began to impact the entire community It made national news headlines. It was even featured on this television show. But here's what I want us to think about this morning. Why is it that a church who's truly impacting its community in a powerful way, strange? Why is that noteworthy? Right, is Is that not exactly why the church was created and commissioned to do just that? I mean, is that not why we're still here? (laughs) Is to change the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so what if the church made community impact ordinary? If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I ask you to stand in honor of God's word if you're able. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Acts chapter 2, beginning verse 41, the word of God says, So those who accepted his message were baptized. That day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Thank you. You may be seated. What would happen if community impact became ordinary? The action step for us today as we're listening to this sermon and and the word of God is speaking into our hearts, the action step for us today is to engage the people in your daily life with gospel care. That you would engage the people in your daily life with the gospel. And as we do that collectively, that we would impact the community in which we live. And so as we look at this passage this morning, we're going we're gonna to focus in on verse 47. In fact, we're going to focus in on the first part of verse 47. That they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And we're going to see in this the reason for the community impact and the result of this community impact. And so we begin with the reason for community impact, and it's there in verse 47. They were praising God. The reason they were impacting the community is that they were praising God. I mean, what was this early church known for? When you look at the description of who they were, what they were about, they were known as a people who were praising God. I mean, just think about the prior verse there, that they were joyful and sincere in their hearts. This church was living out their faith in a very real and powerful way in their daily lives. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowshipping together. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. They were devoted to prayer. God was moving through them. They were generous and sacrificial in their giving. They were displaying an unusual hospitality and caring for people, even the outcast of their society. And in all of these things, they were praising God with a powerful witness in their community. You know, people would say, I used to know John, and he's different now. He's not the same guy that I used to know. I mean, he's, he's, he's not even the same person. I mean, the way that, that he loves people, he, wasn't, he didn't used to be like that. God is doing something in his life. I mean, he used to be a stingy old miser, and I heard that he gave away a bunch of money to help people that were poor. There has to be something to this Jesus. That's what the community starts to say as they were looking at this church. It's exactly what Jesus told them in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they would see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's what's happening in this New Testament church. They are living their lives in such a way that their light is shining in their community. The community is seeing their good works and giving glory to God. It's how they were known. I'm afraid, though, that the church today is known for just about everything else except praising God. Right? I mean, if we were to go around and ask, we're known for political stances. The church is known for fighting amongst itself. <laughs> the church is known for scandals. But what if we were engaging the people in our daily lives with the gospel? Then we might be known for something else. We'd be known for praising God. I mean, that's exactly what the apostles were teaching in the early church. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, Paul says to them, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I mean, this is what they're telling the church to do, to be. They're saying to be kind, be loving, care for people, be at peace, show the love of Jesus 
with everybody in your daily life. These are the things that they're hearing over and over again. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15-17, through 17, Peter says to them, For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. These are the things that they're hearing over and over from their leaders, from, from Paul and from Peter and from John. They're telling them over and over again to make the witness of God's people unmistakable in the community. And when you do, the unbelieving world will take notice. All these people that are becoming part of this New Testament church, they were mostly Jews who were aware of Jesus, that he was crucified just a few weeks before this. They probably were around, or at least had heard about it. These are maybe the same people that were chanting, crucify him, crucify him, just a few weeks ago. These are maybe the same people who had heard Jesus preach before and walked away saying, I don't want anything to do with that message. But now they're saying, I'm going to become part of this new kingdom. Because they're looking at their religious leaders and they're saying, this is dry, this is lifeless, but whatever's going on with this group looks to be real. Whatever's going on with this group, I want to know more about it. Whatever's going on with this group, I want to be a part of it. And what I want our church to be known for in our city is that we are being disciples by loving Jesus, that we are making disciples by proclaiming his gospel to Knoxville and the nations, period. That's, that's what I want us to be known for. So if you've been coming for the first time or coming for your whole life and you're like, I'm just waiting for John to tell us what we're going to do, this is it. It's really simple. I want us to be disciples who make disciples. And when our community thinks and talks about us, that it would be the gospel. That they would say that the gospel is going on at that church. That it's the gospel that's driving us to impact our community. A lot of times what we'll use is guilt to drive us, right? Right? Of, to guilt you into what you should be doing or, or what you shouldn't be doing or what you ought not have done. And guilt can make you move once or maybe a few times, but it's unsustainable because it's not life-changing. The only thing that will change our lives is the gospel. The gospel is the engine for everything that we do. That's why Paul says in Colossians 1.27, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Christ in you. Christ in you. That's what they need to see is Christ in you. The reason for community impact is Christ in me. That we would embody the character of Christ and point people to him. That we would live out our faith in a real way. That we're not going through the motions. That we want our lives to praise God. Leonard Ravenhill once wrote, I'd rather have 10 people that want God than 10,000 people who want to play church. We can work with those 10. And when we do that, God will be glorified and people will pay attention because they're hungry for the gospel. They're hungry for it. Every time that we talk to somebody about the gospel, it's confirmed over and over. They're hungry for the gospel. And of course they are. They were created for it. So let's give it to them. 
It's the reason for this community impact. But I want you to notice the results of the community impact as well. As you go on in verse 47, it says they were praising God. That's the reason. That's the, the witness. And the result is they were enjoying the favor of all the people. They were enjoying the favor of all the people. Isn't that interesting? The result of this powerful witness in their community is that the community was responding positively to them. Now, it's not that the world isn't opposed to the church. We know that it is. Acts tells us that it certainly was. Just turning through the pages of Acts, we see in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, that while they were speaking to the people, the priests the captain of the temple police, the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They were annoyed. You go on to Acts chapter 5, verse 33, it gets a little bit more intense. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So they've gone from annoyed to enraged and wanting to kill. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, verses 57 through 58, they yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, together rushed against Stephen. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Saul agreed with putting him to death. And on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Well, that escalated quickly, didn't it? At first they were annoyed, and then they were enraged, and then they killed them, and then this great persecution breaks out. It's not that the world wasn't opposed to the church. We know that the religious elites were against the church. They were losing their position. They were losing their power. They were losing their influence among the people. And that's the point, among the people. The common people were moved by what they saw in this early church. There was this community that was impacted by this church. They were enjoying the favor of all the people. It means that the people liked them. The people had a good reputation. Like the community thought, the, this church, they, they're good. They're doing good. They kind of liked being around them. I think about uh, a report I heard last Sunday after I preached on hospitality. There was a, a, a couple that came up to me, the Burnett's, some members of our church. And, and this was before they ever even heard this message on hospitality. The night before, they had gone around and they had invited all of their neighbors to come over to the house and have a block party. They said, we don't, we don't really know our neighbors. We want to get to know them. We want to invite them over. And so they did. And guess what? 50 people showed up. Their whole neighborhood showed up at their house. And they had this, this big block party there. And they were enjoying the favor of all the people impacting their immediate neighborhood. And so Christians, we need to stop retreating from our community. And we need to start rescuing our community. We have hope because we have Jesus. And there's no place that is so dark that the light of the world can't shine there. In Acts chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, they say, You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, and with power, and listen, how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. Doing good and, and re releasing or setting free those who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. I want you to know today that God's with us as the Holy Spirit. And that we can go about doing good, setting the captives free from the tyranny of the devil through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can do that. And from the very beginning of Jesus' teaching to his followers, that's the expectation that he laid out in front of them. In his Sermon on the Mount, he told them that they were supposed to be salt. He told them that they were supposed to be light. 
He told them that they were supposed to be a city that's on a hill. He told them that the world would be opposed to Christ, but greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so that means that we can bring hope, we can bring healing through the gospel of Christ, and he will transform these neighborhoods. In fact, in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7, it says, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles that I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. So what did, what did the Lord say to the exiles who were in Babylon? Don't hide in a bunker. Inundate the city with the gospel. Pray for the city. Robert Lewis, in his book, The Church of Irresistible Influence, asked the question, if your church were to disappear tomorrow, would anyone notice? That's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, we would notice, right? But would anybody else notice? That's the question that we basically went out on the street and asked this week. Jared Morgan and I went out and between Dunkin' Donuts and Taco Bell, <laughs> began to ask people, what they knew about Wallace Memorial Baptist Church. I want you to hear what they said. Do y'all know anything about Wallace Memorial Baptist Church? No, sir. <laughs> you ever heard of it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so how long have y'all been here in the neighborhood? Uh, about months. A couple of months? Okay. And, and, but you've never heard of the church? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, if you were, would you ever be open to visiting with the church? Yeah, definitely. Anything? We were trying to talk about going up to the church that's up here. Um, I saw the sign for the church when I was coming up here one day. I was like, man, we need to get going to church on my, yeah. on my day off. That yeah. day, so. so y'all would be open to going to, yeah. to a church if someone invited you to come? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, if you were looking, you know, to go to a church, what are some of the things that you, that might, you know, you would look for in a church? Honestly, just feeling like really accepted, <laughs> like, kind of like, I don't know, some churches I've been to, even though it's really big churches and stuff, it feels like you just go. You're there, kind of atten- just there as attendance. Mm-hmm. I like to feel like I like smaller churches, you know, where it's like family, like you know, okay. it's like come on in, you know. Kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, do you think it's important that the church is making an impact into the community? Definitely. Dude. As a matter of fact, we were up. Uh, I was at work, but somebody came and gave us like two boxes full of food, coloring books for her and things like that. Okay. Knocked on the door. It was, I don't know which church it was, but they they came up and they. Um, I mean, they've helped us out, so okay. we haven't even been there yet. So. Okay. Very cool. Yes, sir. Well, we would like to invite you to come to Wallace Memorial Baptist Church. This is good, actually, right okay. here. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. But we would love for you all to come and visit sometime. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, we, we have services on Sundays at 930 and 11, okay. uh, and lots of stuff for kids uh, and lots of young adults your age that were there. And so we'd like for y'all to, to come and be a part of I'm the pastor of the oh, church. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jared is one of our other pastors at the That's church. Sure. Sure. Uh, but we'd love for y'all to come and check it out. I uh, do see the people on, when you set up something, you do it every week or mm-hmm. something. On Wednesday you know, nights. Like you feed people. Yep. So mm-hmm. I see that. I mm-hmm. do see that. Yeah. But I have never, ever been to this church before, but I may do that and just yeah. visit you. Yeah, come visit sometime. Okay. We'd love it. Okay. All right? Okay. Thank you for stopping and sharing with us. No problem. All right. Have a good day. All right. Y'all too. So y'all are from this area? Where she I from am. Here. You're I'm from, from here? I'm from Memphis. Yeah. You're from Memphis. Okay. Yeah. But you're from here? Yep. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Um, have you ever heard of Wallace Memorial Baptist Church? No. Never heard of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you know anything about that church? Uh, I went there once for my auntie graduation. Okay. Okay. That's the only time she I graduated really there one time. There, yeah. Okay. So would you Would you go to church if someone invited you to go? Yeah. Yeah. If you were If you were wanting to go to a, If you were wanting to go to a church, what would it be like? What would the, What would you want the church to be like? Everybody come in. Everybody walk around and greet each other. Yeah. Each other so it's like kind of fellowship. Yeah. Would it be important that they were like 
doing stuff in the community, like impacting the community anyway? Is that something that you'd want them to do? Yes, sir. And there's a lot of homeless people around here too, though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That don't have nothing to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They don't get invited. Like they don't just get invited to a church. Mm -hmm. Well, so we actually do on Wednesday nights have a dinner out here for the homeless every Wednesday night, right out on the steps, on the front steps of the church. That's crazy. I, um, know that. I never uh, seen no action at that church besides that graduation. Okay. Never seen any action there. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, for real. Yeah. No, I've never seen that's no good. action at that church. Yes. Are you from this area? I am. Did you grow up here? Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. So, uh, are you familiar with Wallace Memorial Baptist Church? I am. Okay. So, what do you? What are your thoughts? What do you know about the church? Well, we had a missionary. My husband's actually a pastor at Zion Baptist Church. Okay. And we had a missionary come and uh, visit with us and just tell us what they were about. And we we're like, well where are you staying? And they're like, well, there's a mission house behind Wallace and we're staying in their house. And we just thought that was incredible because yeah. us being a small church, we don't have anywhere to put the missionaries when they come in. Right. And you all have a house for them. So that was really cool. Okay. So that's one of them. I have friends that send their kids to your uh, daycare and Okay. Um, I hear about Bible school. Okay. My Aunt Millie and Uncle Dan go there. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I all about Wallace. You guys are a great church. Do you think that having an impact in the community is important for the church? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So because I mean, the, several of the things that you mentioned are ways that they're that the church is trying to be involved in, mm -hmm. like like the daycare and stuff Absolutely, like that yeah. into the community. Um, what sort of advice then would you have? for the church and trying to really share the gospel here in, in this neighborhood? Well, so I just got my car clean this morning, so uh -huh. you know, right down the, the way. And while I was sitting there, I was sitting outside and I noticed four homeless people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something that is missed by the church sometimes, mm -hmm. is loving on those people just because they're a hard people group to reach. You sure. know, there's mental illness, there's homelessness and that kind of thing. But I mean, I think you all do a good job with making daycare affordable. I know my friend could not find anywhere and you guys have enough spots open up to love on the community and that kind of thing. So I think that's good. So we actually have a team, we have evangelism teams that are reaching, trying, we're trying to send them out to reach different places, more people groups in our city. Uh, and one of them is, is trying to reach our homeless population. Awesome. Here. So awesome. um, on Wednesday nights, right out there on the steps, mm -hmm. uh, we feed we feed the homeless, probably 50 right. to 70 homeless people every Wednesday night. That's amazing. Uh, and, and actually three now have trusted in Christ and been baptized. Wow, so, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, and see, so, we, we need to know we need that's that's uh, interesting, isn't it? When you go out and just start asking people, those those are the only four people I talked to. So we didn't like cut out the bad ones or the good ones or anything like that. This is those are the four people I talked to, and I want to share with you four observations that I came away with after talking to these people. Okay, the first one is this. I didn't talk to anybody that had a negative view about our church. They just didn't have any view about our church. Okay, so that, I mean, I, I, that's a good thing. We're not overcoming like people hate us. They just don't know who we are. The second observation that I made was that churched people knew a lot about our church, right? Of all the people on earth, I talked to a pastor's wife over here at Dunkin' Donuts, okay? Uh, and so church people knew a lot about our church. Unchurched people knew very little about our church. And so that means that, you know, we, we may be well known among Tennessee Baptists, not so no well known among Tennessee, right? The third thing that I noticed is that the things that they did know about our church were the things that happened outside of the walls, Right? Everything that they mentioned, whether it was the GED graduation or Bible school or feeding the homeless or our daycare or our mission houses, all the things that they mentioned are things that are outside. When she said she doesn't see any action down here, that was hard to hear, right? Because we know we do. There's a lot of action going on here. But all that they see is the stuff that we're doing out there. The last thing that I noticed when I talked to these folks is that every single one of them was willing to come to our church if someone would invite them. 
Every one of them was. And so I, I, I wanted us to see that today because I hope it drives home a point. I'm not just talking about something that happened in West Virginia. I'm talking about something that happened on literally within 50 yards of our front door. That people didn't know about our church as they're standing in the shadow of the steeple of the church, right? And so we want our community impact for Jesus to be unmistakable. That's why every year we are challenging our ministries to get outside the walls. That's why we do the 25 days of Knox Noel in December where there's opportunities every single day of the month to do outreach. That's why we're feeding teachers at our local school. That's why we're trying to bless first responders. That's why we were serving the hospital staff during the pandemic. That's why we're doing all of those things. That's why we're serving in Western Heights and the Montgomery Village communities. That's why we do grief share here at our church. That's why we're forming E-teams that would be sent out to people groups and places in our city. Because one of our 2025 vision goals that you see out in the, in the entrance of our church is that we would have 50 local mission engagements every single month. We want to inundate the city. And when we do that, community impact will become ordinary. That this city will be transformed when Christians proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ faithfully and regularly. The city will be transformed when Christians get outside the building and get into the streets. And that's what happened in Huntington, West Virginia, when a church decided to help their community make good health choices. And it made national news, and it was on a TV show. But why is a church impacting its community weird? Why is that noteworthy? Because that's exactly why we were created and commissioned, to change the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what if the church made community impact ordinary? And why not Wallace? And why not this community? See, Christians today, our action step is to engage the people in your daily life with the gospel. That it might be said of you that we're praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So maybe this morning during the time of invitation, you need to spend time in prayer at your seat or here at this altar, praying that you would be that city on a hill. Maybe you need to pray about becoming part of an evangelism team or a ver- some other ministry in our church that's getting outside the walls and into this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe we need to do what the Lord told the people in Jeremiah to pray for this city, that when it prospers, that we'll prosper. And so maybe you want to come and spend time praying, praying, praying for this city to come to know Jesus. There might be others here today who need to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Just as these people in the first century saw what was happening in the New Testament church and said, I want to know more about Jesus. Maybe you're here today because you want to know more. And I'm here today to tell you that the message that we're trying to take to the city The message that drives everything that we are is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that that Jesus loved us so much that he came to earth and died on the cross to pay the price for our sins because our sin had separated us from God. That we were destined to an eternity in hell apart from God because of our disobedience to the Lord. But Jesus, in his sacrificial death, paid the price for what we've done. And he died in our place as our substitute and was placed in the grave. But on the third day, on Easter Sunday morning, he walked out alive, showing that he was the Son of God, that he is the living Savior, that he conquered sin, that he conquered death, that he conquered hell for you. That you can be forgiven of your sins today, that you can be washed clean, and that you can be made right with God. 
That can happen in your life today. And so in a moment as we have this time of response, there's going to be leaders here across the front. If this is a decision that you want to make in your heart today, then I want you to come. And to share with one of these leaders to say, I want to trust in Jesus today and follow after him. But however God's speaking to your heart, now's the time for us to be doers of this word and not just hearers only. Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. God, we thank you today for your word. Lord, for this example that we see in this church and what you're doing in this church. And God, our prayer is that that sort of impact in the city would be ordinary here in our church, in our community. Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, that we would inundate, infiltrate, impact this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there are people who live on these streets, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, on our kids' sports teams who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And if they were to die today, that they would spend eternity in hell apart from you. So God, may you work in our hearts to impact this community with your good news that Jesus loves them and wants to save them. And God, may your gospel drive us to impact this community for your kingdom's sake. God, I pray for any that might be here this morning that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus as their Savior and follow him as their Lord and King. We pray it in his name. Amen.
you all can be seated as we continue to worship through a time of giving. Um, Dr. Ashley Maples is going to come lead us in our offertory prayer. Uh, and uh, just a reminder that you can give. Uh, and as you exit on the back of the columns, there's some black boxes you can drop your offerings in. You can also give uh, by texting or going online on our website. Uh, and just want to thank you for all of your giving and your faithfulness week after week. Dr. Maples. Father, <clears throat> we come singing hallelujah to you this morning. We thank you for meeting with us this morning. We thank you that we have this opportunity to meet together in your house in your name. Father, make us a church that will impact our community. Keep our hearts open. Teach us to say yes and not no. Father, give us a heart for serving you because that's what it's all about. And that's why we're here as a church. Thank you, Father, that that you've given us this wonderful place. We thank you that you've placed us here in this community. And Father, we didn't all know we'd be here at this point in time. You did, though. We're all together here for a purpose. Thank you, Lord, that we're about to, sh to share our tithes and offerings to help make these things possible in the community, Father. We thank you for your love, and we honor you and praise you. It's in your name. Amen. Spirit Lifters Spirit Lifters is a new Wallace Memorial Women's Ministry for those who have lost a spouse. Losing a spouse is a traumatic, life-changing event. You go along happily married for many years to a life partner and your best friend. You're a team of two on your life's journey. And then suddenly, you're half a team when your sweetheart goes to heaven. People are very kind and caring to you and ask you how you're doing and you say, oh, I'm fine, just fine. But there's a hole in your heart, very large. God lay on my heart. We need to support each other and be encouragers to each other and have some fun together. God was propelling us to start something to respond to this need in our church. So we planned for a luncheon in April to bring together the hurting women who needed encouragement and we had 45 respond to come to our launch lunching. Some of the things that we have done since then is we went to the East Tennessee Historical Center, we went to the UT Gardens, we went to the uh, Oak Lily Farm, to the Day Lily Festival there, we went to the Park View Assisted Living on Emory Road, hosted by Shirley Barnes and saw the movie Sully in their beautiful movie theater and we had free popcorn. Uh, we went to dinner at Calhoun's at Melton Hill Lake. 30 of us went to see the Ruth drama about Ruth the widow in the Bible and that was at Sevierville at the dinner theater at the Bible Times Theater there. And that was an inspirational time for us. You know, when we started the ministry, we decided we needed a name for it. And it needed to be a name that adequately described what we were doing. Betty Perrin suggested spirit lifters. And we all said, that's it. That's what we want to be. We want to lift up these women spiritually and emotionally and have fun together. And Spirit Lifters became our name. I didn't mention that we don't want to just have fun and eat all the time, although we like that a lot. We want to be servers in mission projects. We hope you will pray for our ministry and maybe recommend somebody that you know that might benefit from it. Christ is our rock. 
and spirit lifters are the ones that carry this out. Isn't that awesome? Miss Carolyn and that group does a fantastic job. And so there might be people here that were unaware of that group. And maybe this is a group that you would love to be a part of, that, that you're someone who's lost a spouse and you'd love to be a part of it. I want to encourage you to get in contact with the church office and we'll, we'll get you connected with Miss Carolyn and, and with that group. And uh, you can get involved with those different activities and have your spirit lifted. So uh, thank you all for that. Let me introduce you this morning, uh, Miss Karen Becker. Karen, if you'll come on up here with me and stand right here. Uh, Karen's been visiting our church for a couple weeks now, maybe a month or so. Uh, and uh, she is a uh, born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and she wants to become part of our church family by transfer of her letter from a church in Texas. And uh, we're glad that the Lord has brought Karen to be here at our church. will not you join me in welcoming her? You're welcome. You can have a seat. Uh, and then let me give you a couple of other announcements before we are dismissed. One is that we've started doing some um, improvements on our campus uh, for some office and study space for, um, for our office pastors and staff. Uh, and it's what I used to call the hall to nowhere, uh, this hall that goes around the top side of the balcony up there. Uh, and so you might have noticed today, or maybe you will now that I've said it, uh, that, the, that there's a, a wall over there on that hallway now. And so it's kind of closed. It, it's enclosed that, that end of that hallway area. We're trying to maximize and utilize every square inch that God has given us here and be good stewards of the resources he's given us. And so we're going to try to use that area up there that maybe four people walk down ever uh, to use for space that we can study and, and, and do work from throughout the week. You can still go out that door uh, and, um, and exit, but if you see that, that's what's going on up there. Uh, and then secondly, Revive 2021 is a women's night of worship, or actually it's not a night, it's during the day, uh, November the 6th from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, if this is something, ladies, that you want to be a part of, you can get tickets online on our website or over in the source, and so I want to encourage you to do that. And then the last thing is our Thanksgiving service is upcoming on Tuesday, November the 23rd at 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, and we'll have a, a time of worship. We'll do the Lord's Supper and have a time of giving thanks to God for all the ways that he's blessed us as we're going into the Thanksgiving weekend. So if you're our guest today and I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, I'd love to get to know you. Right after the service, I'm going to be in the atrium over to the right in the pastor's corner. Please stop by and introduce yourself. I'd love to say hello to you. So you've heard your mission for this week. You're now sent to Knoxville and the Nations.